We opened the show yesterday with a discussion about the crisis of femininity and the rise of just pearly things. Uh, and to very briefly summarize the key points made in that conversation, girls are growing up in a culture that is openly hostile to femininity and many are forced to navigate the minefield without the benefits of strong female role models to show them the path and this crisis is self-perpetuating. It grows exponentially because the young women with single mothers eventually become single mothers themselves, repeating the cycle indefinitely unto infinity and into this field of confusion and female hatred steps gals like just pearly things and others quickly earning an enormous following of young women who understandably flock to somebody who has a message that embraces femininity rather than treating it like a disease. Just pearly things is often good at identifying the problems in our culture as they pertain to the situations that women face and deserves credit for speaking up in defense of femininity rather than denigrating it and calling for its eradication. Essentially. But in my view she misses the mark when it comes to the remedy. She seems to basically understand the disease but she doesn't have the right prescription for it or at least the full prescription. Yes, women should reject the programming that our culture wants to subject them to. Programming which seeks to spay and masculinize them. Yes, they should work hard. They should take care of their minds and bodies. Yes, they should strive for success, including financial success. But the life of hedonism and materialism and luxurious wealth, remaining unmarried while sleeping with dozens of different men and so on is not the ideal to strive towards. Rather what women are called to and created for in the only sort of life that will be truly happy, that they'll find true happiness and joy in is a life of service as mother and housewife. Women, the vast majority of women anyway, are called to be wives and mothers to be servants of their husbands. Now they may be called to serve in other ways too, but first they must care for their families. If there's any saving our civilization at this point, which I think there is, but if there is, this is how it will be done, and this is who will do it. It's not going to be saved by influences who are sitting in front of cameras, whether the woman in front of the camera is just pearly things or me or anyone else. It'll be saved through the formation of strong, intact, loving, and well-served families. That is the only way. It is the only way forward. If every woman in the country starts going to the gym and making lots of money and starts having sex with lots of attractive men and yet they don't get married and have children and raise and love those children, then we will still be headed to ruin. It'll be a slightly different kind of ruin, but ruin all the same. Those women themselves will ultimately find the happiness that, are, that they are able to derive in that lifestyle. They'll find that it's shallow and it's fleeting and in the end they'll die alone. Loved by no one. Loving no one. Remembered by no one. Leaving no legacy behind. The masculinized and infertile and masculine women that our left-wing culture seeks to create and then this other sort of woman, both unmarried, both childless, will look very similar in the end. Having taken two very different paths just to arrive together at essentially the same place. It's the family woman, the devoted mother and wife whose different path actually leads to a different and much better conclusion. Now I've of course been preaching this message for as long as I've had an audience to preach to, and I've found that there are like two or three basic responses or rebuttals I guess that I always hear from young women who, who may for the most part line up with me ideologically but who doubt the wisdom of the get married and have kids prescription. And I was greeted with these same responses after the show yesterday and many messages and comments. What I'd like to do today is answer the objections or at least what seems to be the one principal objection. The claim that I so often hear is that. Well, marriage and family life is a trap, it's a scam. Just not for women, the whole thing is rigged towards us. What a woman should do is have the entire enterprise as a backup and live her best life. In fact, there's a whole movement online, women going their own way. And that's basically the idea. Give up on this stuff and do something else. This argument was summarized in a comment from a listener named Jessica, which I'll read because I think it just is representative of this sort of mentality. She says, Still sounds like Gray and most Tradkin's definition of what femininity means is exclusively through the lens of men's wants and needs. Unfortunately, that ideal will no longer work in the modern world with birth control, hookup culture, social media and court systems that favor women, and the denigration of traditional femininity. I don't agree with all of Pearlie's views, but it sure beats Gray's prescriptions for young women. Again, I've read a great many comments making the same kind of point. A private message from another listener has a similar theme. Says Gray, I agree with many of your opinions, but your message to women is off base. Young women follow just pearly things because her lifestyle is the ideal whether you admit it or not. Wealth, status, beautiful men. We're biologically programmed to want those things. Marriage is holding us back. The only solution in modern society is to reject the life of submission as you call it. So what is the problem with, uh, this view? Well, to begin with, it's nothing less than a full unconditional surrender to the culture. 
It's true that the culture has increasingly made it difficult for both women and men to form and maintain strong, intact, lasting families, and that's because the elites who run our society don't want you to live that kind of life. They prefer that you focus on your individual wants, fulfilling your own needs and satisfying your own desires. That's what they prefer for you. That's the life they want for you. A self-focused life is precisely the sort of life they wish for you. Makes you easier to manipulate. Less of a threat to their agenda. Not really a threat at all. I mean, if you're just out there focused on yourself, um, you know, being a consumer buying lots of things for yourself, consuming things for yourself, um, you know, and all the rest of it. You're not a threat to their agenda at all. I mean, you're going along with it. Um, all the things mentioned by Jessica in her comment, all those things represent conspiracy against the family. She's right about that. The way the family court systems are set up, birth control, all the rest of it. It's an attack on the family. So what is the answer? To give up. To give the conspirators exactly what they want? To reward them for their efforts by turning your back on the very thing they've been assaulting for decades. The family is the fortress that they have been attacking, and you can defend it with your life or you can open the gate for them. But if you choose to turn traitor, then at least be honest about what you're doing. Be honest, this is not a rejection of the left's agenda of a cultural elite's agenda. You are, you are selling out, it is treachery. It is certainly not the noble or feminine response to open the gate and let the enemy in. To switch sides because the offer is too tempting? I mean that approach is many things, but it certainly isn't feminine. And where you go instead? I mean, what is the next move? To give up on the family is to give up on human civilization, seeing as there cannot be a human civilization without the family. So, uh, what's plan B after you've given up on civilization? Where? What's next? You're also giving up on yourself, on your own legacy, your own bloodline. You're... You are descended from a long line of women stretching back thousands of years, who formed families and raised children often under circumstances far more dire than what we face. And you're giving up on them too. You? You are betraying your future and your past. You're selling out everything and what is your reward? Living your best life. I mean, the unfortunate irony is that many of the people that many of the women who, uh, sell out on these things and in favor of, well, I'll just focus on myself and try to live my best life. Many of them are never even going to live a happy life, so they end up being miserable. They end up broken alone with nothing. But even if you find it, the best life. So what? I mean, who cares about life if you have nothing meaningful to spend it on? I, I have a good life. I don't have just pearly things life, but I have a good life. Uh, and nearly all the joy and happiness I derive from having that life is that it allows me to serve my family. That's pretty much it. That's the entire thing. That's why I like having my life is that I find great pleasure in being able to serve my husband and six children. Proud of that fact. If I didn't have them, my life would mean very little to me. I mean, I could advance in a career, eat fancy foods, and go to exotic places alone. But for what? Now. Does that mean if you start a family that you're guaranteed to live a joyful and fulfilled life? Well, of course not. It's a risk. Uh, and yes, the risks are in some ways much greater in modern times. We have all been poisoned by this demonic culture to one extent or another. We are all poisoned. If you marry someone, you are marrying someone who has been poisoned. Who has ingested the poison. Who has, uh, you know, had taken a drink from the well of modern culture. Everybody has, as have you. And yes, if things go sideways, if you're a woman and you marry a man and your husband turns out to be a disloyal monster, or if you turn out to be a disloyal monster, or if you both do, um, the deck will be stacked against you outside of court. No, no, there's no question about that. Divorce may cause him to end your life. And you know, if you give your heart to a man, if you bind yourself to him not only through the marriage vow, but then also through children you conceive together, then he will have... They will have all the motivation he needs to rip your guts out and put you in the ground. That is absolutely true. That's how much risk there is, but it's a risk worth taking. Every great joy can become a great tragedy if you aren't careful. Or if you have very bad luck. That's true. Uh, so is the answer then to forego all joy? To say forget about joy because it might not work out? To embrace a life of loneliness and misery because you're worried that if you aim higher you'll end up lonely and miserable? You're worried that you'll end up in this state, so instead you say, well, I might as well just live in this state to begin with. Doesn't make any sense. So you take the risk, and you mitigate the risk at the same time by being smart about who you married and by grounding your marriage and in your family and faith and mutual devotion. 
Uh, and by working hard every day to hold up your own end of the bargain. Because, yeah, there are some women out there who do everything right in their end, and then you know they're great women and they're devoted to their families, and they're intensely loyal and all of that, and their families fall apart anyway because they accidentally married a soulless, disloyal scumbag. I mean, that does happen, and sometimes it happens in the reverse. But that's not... That's not the majority of cases. Most of the time it takes two to tango. Two to get married, two to ruin the marriage. Which means that marriage is not a mere roll of the dice. There's quite a lot you can do to secure your good fortune. That's why I never cared about the statistics. You know what I get. I was getting married and I heard about this. Statistically, this is... I'm not a statistic. I'm not just some number on a spreadsheet. And neither is my husband. We're human beings. I am not subject to statistics. Not merely subject to them. Because the one thing statistics don't take into account are choices. It's about the choices you make whether your marriage works or not. It's about choices that are made in the marriage. If one or both of you make bad choices, your, your chances are going to be very poor. If you make good choices, they won't be. That's what it is. And yet the risk is always there. So will you live in fear of it? Or will you have the courage and go forward anyway? One other thing I want to say, you know why I, then this is important to say that it's just not true, okay? It's just not true that a life of obscene luxury and materialism and selfishness and self-service and of you know sleeping with many different men and in all of that, it's not true that that is the ideal. Which we so often hear these days, that's the ideal. You know, non-monogamy. Having many sexual partners, that's the ideal, they say. That's not true. Much less is it what we are biologically programmed to desire. No, it's what we're culturally programmed to desire that is the cultural programming. But I know that it's not biological because I'm a biological organism and I don't desire that. I don't want any life but the one I have. I don't want any man but the one I married. I mean, you could listen to that and say, oh, that's not true, she's just saying that. That's a cope on your part. That's resentment and envy talking. If I could do my life over from the start, I would find my husband again and marry him again. If I live 100 lives, I'd marry him in all of them. That's what it means to love somebody. And love is the ideal. Because it's not mere biological programming, it is transcendent. And trust me, it's well worth the risk.